Question oral, oral questions, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, in the last month we learned the Liberal government allowed two different American billionaires to enter Canada and they waived quarantine rules. Both times the Public Safety Minister said he had no knowledge of what happened. But he's just one of five ministers who can approve such waivers. Since the, Prime, since the Public Safety Minister didn't do it, it must have been the Prime Minister. So my question is for him. Why are there one set of rules for the rich friends of this government and one set of rules for everyone else? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite in Wells know that that was a decision taken on the border at, by locals on the ground that was made in error and the situation was fixed afterwards. But I want to take this moment to thank all the volunteers, voters, organizers and election workers who participated in by-elections in both Toronto Centre and York Centre yesterday. We showed that during a pandemic, Canadians continue to believe strongly in the strength of our democratic institutions. I want to congratulate Marcy Ian and Yara Sachs on being elected as the Liberal Members of Parliament for Toronto and York Centre. We look forward to having these two strong women join our House. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, after weeks of being pushed by families of the victims and by my colleague from Lakeland, the government finally relented and announced the beginning of the public inquiry into the worst mass shooting in Nova Scotia in Canada's history. This was after they had to backtrack on their decision to refuse to even hold an inquiry, a decision that was panned by every Nova Scotian in this House, including members of the Prime Minister's own caucus. Mr. Speaker, why did the Prime Minister delay delivering justice to the families in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, following one of the worst mass shootings in Canada's history, I had the uh, sorry responsibility to speak with the members of families who'd lost loved ones, who'd had their lives and their communities shattered. Uh, I gave them a commitment that we would find out exactly what happened, what errors were made, who was to be held responsible for those errors, and demonstrate that we were committed to getting the answers all Nova Scotians and indeed all Canadians want. We proposed an inquiry that would be able to move quickly on that but families said they wanted a national public inquiry. That's exactly what we're moving forward with so that they get all the answers they need the way they need them. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, in the last week, the Minister of Indigenous Services and the Grand Chief of the Assembly of First Nations both called on the RCMP Commissioner to resign. The Minister of Public Safety has been silent. The Minister blamed CBSA officers for his failures, and now his own Cabinet colleague is calling for the resignation of a Chief under his watch. It's hard to believe that minister was once a chief himself. My question to the Prime Minister is simple. Who is in charge of the RCMP? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, there is a long history of systemic racism in our institutions in this country, including in the RCMP. We've acknowledged, as has the Commissioner, that throughout its history, the service has not always treated racialized and Indigenous people fairly. There is no question for anyone on this side of the House or, uh, that the systemic racism exists within the RCMP. We are therefore working with the Commissioner, who will bring forward meaningful change to ensure police treat all people with dignity and respect. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. President, the government was always long. Mr. Speaker, the government was there during the first wave of the pandemic at the border with rapid testing and with assistance. And yet, some countries had a million tests a week. In Canada, almost zero. So why doesn't this government draw some lessons from the first wave and do its work properly? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, from the beginning of January, our public health agencies were holding meetings to see what was coming out of China and concerns about the coming pandemic. From the very beginning of the pandemic here in Canada, we prepared the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, or CERB, and we delivered it to millions of Canadians throughout the country. Our public servants, the public service, worked very hard to offer assistance almost immediately. 
assistance that people needed. The leader of the opposition is saying that we did the wrong thing by helping families and that we should have helped businesses instead. We did help businesses, but first we helped families, Mr. Speaker. The honorable leader of the opposition. The prime minister likes to pretend that he's a partner of the provinces, but his minister blamed Quebec and the provinces for the, f and for the current situation. And the prime minister is saying he's going to interfere in areas of provincial jurisdiction. Will this prime minister stop blaming others and finally get to work? The right honorable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, we respect and understand areas of provincial jurisdiction on this side of the house. And we fully recognize that long-term care in Quebec, for example, is an area of provincial responsibility. But we want to work with Quebec, with all the provinces, to ensure that our seniors are protected throughout the country, that there is a standard of care that can reassure all Canadians, seniors and families, that we're taking care of seniors throughout the country. That's the federal government's responsibility to ensure that all Canadians are taken care of, and that's what we're going to do. The Honourable Member for Belleuil Chambly. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would like to discuss what happened to a teacher at the University of Ottawa. The Prime Minister said we're all responsible for our words. Well, I guess we're also all responsible for the makeup we wear. Isn't that right? During his blackface episode, I didn't call the Prime Minister racist. And in the same spirit, does the Prime Minister recognize that the Indian Act is racist and systemic? And that the very name is an insult to the First Nations of Canada. Mr. Speaker, for many years, the federal government has recognized that the Indian Act is a colonial law and that is part of sustainable racism, something that the bloc does not recognize. And this is a problem that needs to be fixed. We are working with indigenous peoples in order to move past the Indian Act. We have signed agreements with several communities and we're working with all the communities throughout the country to be able to end the, this law, but that will be done in partnership and not by decree, as the bloc seems to suggest. The Honourable Member for Belleuil Chambly. Well, this government seems to have no trouble rewriting history. The bloc wishes for a nation-to-nation -nation perspective, but the Prime Minister doesn't even seem to know what a nation is. The Prime Minister doesn't seem to be following the news. In March, he didn't seem to want to recognize the existence of systemic racism. Consider, consider the words of the Bible, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Is he not ready to realize that it is necessary to have a nation to nation relationship between Canada and First Peoples, the right honorable prime minister? Mr. Speaker, if the leader of the Bloc Québécois would deign to talk to the leaders of First Nations communities throughout the country, he would see that there are several nations that still wish to have the partnership and protection, even under this unjust colonial legislation, before moving past it. Whereas others would like to do away with it more quickly. So we are working in partnership. With these nations, we are, we are dialoguing and we will continue to respect reconciliation in partnership at the nation's pace and not at our pace. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you. Today, I met with FTQ representatives and they repeated that they wish to have public universal public health benefits. because, for PharmaCare rather, that almost a million Quebecers don't buy the drugs they need because it's too expensive. Why won't this federal government create a universal, entirely public PharmaCare program? The right honorable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, no one should have to choose between paying for medication and, or food. We will continue to work with the provinces to reduce drug prices throughout the country.
We have already taken steps to reduce drug prices by $13 billion, and we will continue to work while respecting provincial jurisdiction to offer a system for pharmacare that will cost Canadians less so that they can pay for the drugs they need. Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Tunney's Pasture is a daycare center in Ottawa. It's not for profit. Their landlord recently increased the rent to $14,000 a month, forcing this daycare to close. But here's the clincher. Guess who the landlord is? The government of Canada. Now, now, it is unbelievable that a government would allow this to happen. You know what really sucks is when your daycare center shuts down in the middle of a pandemic. Will the Prime Minister admit that his words on childcare were again just empty promises? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we will be looking into this situation because indeed it is alarming uh, and I thank the member of the opposition, the, the uh, member of the New Democratic Party for bringing that up. Um, I also uh, want to highlight that we have been working closely with the provinces on moving forward uh, on child care. Uh, we know that child care is not just a social necessity but an economic necessity. This pandemic has shown uh, that the cost on women uh, for uh, having to make choices, impossible choices between caring for their kids or seeing their kids cared for and getting back to work uh, needs to come to an end. That's why we're moving forward on child care. The Honourable Member for chicoutimi le This morning, we've seen that when public servants who are part of the same team are not able to understand each other because bilingualism has been put aside during the pandemic, it leads to chaos and a lack of mutual understanding. And that's what we've seen in the application of assistance measures. So a simple question, if is, is the lack of bilingualism in the public service to blame for the lack of consistency in assistance measures? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to answer this question. It's an important question. Since I am a Francophone and from Quebec by, myself, I think we all understand that the position of French in the public service is essential, not only for public service to be able to do their work, but also to be able to serve Canadians in the language of their choice. And we will continue to work closely with the public service to ensure that everyone knows that the right to work in French is an essential one. The Honourable Member for chicoutimi le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, I don't know if we're talking about the same thing here, but there have been video conferences entirely in English with documents that were never translated. And in the time of COVID, francophones in public health feel more and more isolated. And it's not like the government isn't aware of this. The official languages commissioner raised the problem, but once again, the liberals didn't do anything. What is the message we're sending to francophones working in public health? Get organized, make it work. Why did the government ignore the official languages commissioner? The Honourable Minister, thank you very much. I'd like to thank my colleague for being able to discuss this important issue. I agree that the right to work in French in the public service is essential. But unlike him, I recognize that we work very well with the Commissioner for Official Languages and we will continue to do so. Because the Commission for Official Languages is crucial to ensure that in the public service, we always respect the right to work in the language of your choice. Lisker. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure that the Prime Minister gets hundreds of requests to meet, from, meet with Canadians from right across the country, and I'm sure that because the Prime Minister's time is precious, he must make deliberate decisions on who he meets with and why. With that in mind, why did the Prime Minister choose to meet with multiple Chinese Communist Party elites who have apparent links to gangs, illegal casinos, and organized crime here in Canada? Wow. Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to answer that question. As, as we all know in this House, the relationship with Canada, uh, with China and Canada, is an intricate, difficult, and complex relationship that we are managing carefully, particularly in light of the fact that we have Canadians who have been arbitrarily held in detention. We will continue to do everything we can to ensure that human rights are protected, our Canadians' lives are protected, and we will continue to speak up uh, strongly and forcefully for all issues that affect us and our, in that relationship with China. The Honourable Member for Portage Lisker. Well, we know that some of these bad actors are also big donors to the Liberal Party and the Trudeau Foundation. You know, we're known by the company that we keep, Mr. Speaker, and this Prime Minister seems quite comfortable hanging out with Chinese Communist Party officials, which begs the question. Does this Prime Minister's fear of Communist China and his refusal to, for example, ban Huawei from Canada's 5G, or stand up for Canadians who are being held, held hostage in China, have anything to do with him being compromised by his cosy relationship with CCP officials? Good the Honourable Minister. Uh, I'd like to thank my colleague for the question. We will take no lessons from the Conservative when it comes to standing up to China, Mr. Speaker. We were the very first country in the world to suspend our extradition treaty after the imposition of a national security law. We suspended the export of sensitive equipment, and we have updated our travel advisory. Mr. Speaker, we have been a leading voice in the world when it comes to defending human rights, and we will continue to defend the rights and interests of Canadians around the world and stand up against anyone who would go against our interests. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Carleton. This government is waging a war against work. It is trapping people in poverty. According to a report from the finance minister department obtained by a journalist, a single mother earning $30,000 a year would lose about 70 cents for each additional dollar earned. So for example, if she earns $55,000, she would actually lose 80 cents on the dollar. And it is the people with the least money who end up losing the most. Why is this government penalizing people who are just trying to work to get away from their situation of poverty? The Honourable Minister. A wolf in sheep's clothing. I never thought I'd see one on the floor of the House of Commons. The reality is when we put forward measures to actually cut taxes for the middle class and raise taxes on the wealthiest 1%, that member voted against it. When we changed the Canada Child Benefit to put more money in the pockets out of middle class families and stop sending child care checks to millionaires, that member voted against it. And with respect to the measures we put forward in this pandemic to ensure that middle class and low income families could keep food on the table and a roof over their heads, that member stepped up to the microphone and said an approach of big fat government programs wouldn't help Canadians. Those workers deserve to know that their government will have their backs and that's precisely what we're going to do. L'honorable député de Carleton. Well, that member is a sheep in wolf's clothing. Oh. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, speaking of, of creatures that don't actually exist, you know, he speaks about this so-called middle-class tax cut. Well, the report from the Finance Department says that its effects are, quote, difficult to spot. So it's kind of like the Loch Ness Monster. Big, notorious, spoken of often, but no evidence it actually exists. Now, Mr. Speaker, what the report does say is that when poor people in this country get up and go to work, this government takes more in clawbacks and taxes than they're allowed to keep of that, eat, that extra Canadian dollar. Why are they punishing work? The Honourable Minister. I'm entertained by the Honourable Member citing a, a, a mythical creature that's dear to my Scottish heritage. That's about as far as I can remain interested in this uh, ridiculous line of questioning, Mr. Speaker. The reality is programs like the Canada Emergency Response Benefit have landed on the kitchen tables of 9 million Canadians. Programs like the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy have protected the jobs of 3 million Canadians. Programs like the Emergency Business Account have supported 775,000 Canadian businesses so workers can remain on the payroll. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to supporting low-income workers, we are looking out for their interests and, more importantly, advancing programs that are actually helping them get to buy during a time of unprecedented difficulty. The Honourable Member for Abitibi-Témiscamingue. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, Quebec announced that the closure of businesses in red zones would continue until the 23rd of November. We are now in the second month of the second wave, and there are still entire industries that are still waiting for fixed cost assistance from Ottawa for the first month. The government has not ha, did not help businesses during the first wave, and he was and the government wasn't there during the beginning of the second wave. Businesses may go bankrupt. I want a date. When is the government going to table a program to help businesses in Quebec with their fixed costs? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our businesses are facing difficult times, especially those in red zones. With that in mind, we hope to work in collaboration with the Bloc Québécois. We want to present a new approach to commercial rent to help renters directly to support SMEs through loans of $60,000 with a forgivable portion of $20,000, as well as the extension of the wage subsidy program. And I hope to work with my colleague, the honorable member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. But I didn't hear a date. I'll give you a date. The, on the 11th of April, the bloc included a section in a motion on assistance to fixed costs for businesses, and the government voted for that. And yet, since then, all they've come up with is an unhelpful rent program, which, which businesses were not able to use. And now we're in the second month of the second wave. We can't have an off-the-cuff approach. We need to take action. We want a date. When are we finally going to see this assistance for businesses, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that the governments of Quebec and Canada are working well together on economic measures, and the Quebec Economy Minister thanked the Canadian government for all of the assistance offered since the beginning of the pandemic. Because entrepreneurs, whether in a BTP Timiskaming, my colleague's writing, or in a Hunsi Karcheville, elsewhere in Quebec, throughout the country, we've been there from the very beginning with help, loans, liquidity. Some of the loans are forgivable, some are grants and assistance for fixed costs. We've been there from the beginning and we will continue to be there. Thank you. Member for Calgary Nose Hill. Radio Canada reported that the Liberals signed contracts that gave the United States and Britain first access to vaccines ahead of Canadians. Potential vaccines from Novavax, AstraZeneca, Pfizer and Moderna all report a minimum three-month delay for Canadians in favour of Americans and the Brits. Are the Liberals worried about producing documents related to the COVID vaccine because they know it will show that they've signed contracts that put Canadians at the back of the line like they did with rapid testing? The Honourable Minister. Mr. President, we have put in place seven entente and we continue the negotiations. Mr. Speaker, we have seven agreements. All of those companies to ensure that Canadians have access to vaccines as soon as they are approved. We're working diligently to ensure that once a vaccine is ready, we will be ready to deliver it to Canadians. We're going to protect Canadians and we're going to stand by them right through this pandemic, Mr. Speaker. Member for Calgary, Knows Hill. No answer there. That's interesting. So R Radio Canada did report that Canadians will have that COVID vaccines delivered later than other countries. And I think that's what the parliamentary secretary was dancing around there. So that sort of incompetence means that just like their delay in rapid tests, the fact that we don't have rapid tests right now and we're seeing cases increase, when a vaccine is eventually ready, Canada will be at the back of the line. So I'll ask again. Can the minister confirm that she agreed to contracts that put Canadians three months behind at a minimum behind the Americans when it came to a COVID-19 vaccine. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The government is, of course, working on all possible fronts to deliver safe and effective COVID-19 treatments and vaccines to Canadians as quickly as possible. That's why we have, Mr. Speaker, seven agreements with up to 358 million doses. It's interesting the member across is listening to experts now. She wasn't listening to them yesterday when they told her that her backseat driving motion, playing politics with our pandemic management, Mr. Speaker, was out of line. But we're going to make sure that we continue to deliver the contracts, that we deliver the personal protective equipment, that we build the domestic supply, and yes, we ensure that vaccines are there when Canadians need them so we can put an end to this pandemic and protect Canadians. Thank you, Mr. The Honourable Deputy de Charbourg. The Honourable Member for Charbourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Premier of Quebec extended the red zone provisions for 28 further days. Restaurants are suffering, in fact, they're closed, gyms are closed and other businesses are suffering as well. And yet, the Liberal government does have a solution to help Quebec. 
rapid testing. When are we going to have rapid testing in Quebec? The Honourable Minister for for health. We'll be providing Quebec with 200,000 rapid tests this week, as a matter of fact. And Mr. Speaker, all provinces and territories are receiving rapid point of care testing over the next weeks to come. We've been working very closely with our prov provincial and territorial partners to make sure they have the tools that they need so that they can have a robust testing and screening strategy no matter which province Canadians are in. Honorable Deputy de the Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, that's all very well, but since the very beginning of the pandemic, I remember on the 31st of January at the Committee of Health, I was told that they were starting to look at protocols and that then PPE was being sent to China. Can the minister confirm that hundreds of thousands of tests will be sent to Quebec to help 8 million Quebecers? Frankly, Mr. Speaker, yes. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. The people of Niskandag are facing yet another week without clean water. No water for the showers, no water for toilets. Health Canada nurses being forced to get water from jugs in the river. And we remember this Prime Minister's promise to the people of Niskandaga, how he sent his minister north for the photo op to promise clean water for all First Nations. Well, that was four years ago, and now we have an evacuation in the middle of a pandemic. So I'm asking this Prime Minister, What's it going to take for him to sit down with the Scandiga and put an end to this disgraceful abuse of their rights and dignity? Honourable Minister for Indigenous Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me say it. it's entirely unacceptable that the Scandiga has gone without clean water for 25 years. Members should note that this government has invested $16.5 million for a new plant fix the distribution system, fix the wastewater system. That's cold comfort, obviously, for those people who are now in Thunder Bay evacuated, except for 24 members who are ensuring safety within the community. We're prepared to evacuate those as well. Uh, but let me, rest, let me reassure this House in saying that we will not rest until the system is fixed and that the members can go back and safely enjoy the water that they're entitled to. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Mr. Speaker, 19 residents have died from COVID-19 at Parkview Place in Winnipeg. COVID cases are rising in this facility and in other care homes owned by this federal government across the country. Their disregard for seniors and other residents, including disabled persons during the pandemic, is a national tragedy. Workers and residents' lives are on the lines and families are terrified to lose their loved ones. Meanwhile, the Liberal government missing in action. People need help now. When will the Liberal stop putting profit over the well-being of residents in long-term care homes. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I share the member opposite's concern about what's happening in long-term care homes across the country, and certainly the loss of life through the first wave of the pandemic was unacceptable. That's why, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, in the speech from the throne, we have talked about the importance of setting national standards. In addition, Mr. Speaker, we have employed and, uh, and mobilized through the Canadian Red Cross hundreds, if not thousands, of workers across the country to support provinces and territories as they seek to prevent COVID-19 from entering long-term care homes. And Mr. Speaker, we'll be there for Canadians no matter which province they are in. The Honourable Member for Longueuil, Charles Lemoyne. Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that safe, affordable housing is a way to slow down community transmission. In my riding, there is a great need for more affordable housing. That's why I am so excited by the Rapid Housing Initiative. Can the Minister give the House an update on the implementation of this new program? Thank you. The Honourable Minister. I want to thank my colleague for her question and for being so passionate about this issue. And I announced the new $1 billion Rapid Housing Initiative that will quickly build 3,000 new affordable housing units for the most vulnerable, Mr. Speaker. The first $500 million will go to the municipalities that have the highest number of individuals experiencing homelessness. The second $500 million will go to nonprofit organizations, indigenous governing bodies, provinces, and other municipalities. Mr. Speaker, quite simply, this is the national housing strategy at work. The Honorable Member for Barry Innisville. Minister, we have a problem. Despite the billions of dollars the Liberals claim that they've thrown at Veterans Affairs, the backlog in claims is approaching 50,000. In fact, 
It's now normal for veterans and their families to wait two years for their claims to be processed while the standard is 16 weeks. This wasn't a problem that started with COVID. Something, someone, or the system is failing veterans, and it's happened under the Liberals' watch. Can the minister tell the House what specific direction, if any, he has given Veterans Affairs to reduce the backlog? Honourable Minister. And I appreciate my honourable colleague's question, and it's certainly vitally important. And we have invested just about $200, $200 million to allow us to hire new staff and speed up the process to make sure that veterans receive their, their financial compensation faster. Veterans should receive their benefits and services they're entitled to in a timely manner. And as I said many times, this backlog is totally unacceptable. And I can assure my honourable colleague, it's a number one priority for me, and we will continue to work on it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Barry Innisfil. Well, Minister, it's getting worse, not better. We're at a point in time where access to benefits veterans and their families need should be easier to get, not harder. And yet veterans are saying that they're having a hard time getting the necessary paperwork to apply for financial compensation and benefits, further delaying their claims. Now, the minister knew this in the spring, that the benefits could be withheld because he and his officials were warned about it, and now it's happening. Again, I'll ask the minister, what direction, if any, has he given Veterans Affairs to resolve this issue so at-risk veterans and their families are not prevented from accessing vital financial support they desperately need? Thank you. Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I thank my honourable colleague. And of course, any, any veteran that's in a, in a dire situation, we have the emergency fund there in place in order to make sure that an emergency situation has taken place. On the backlog, which is a major issue I indicated to my honourable colleague, yes, we have invested just under $200 million to make sure we hire more staff, to make sure that the department is coordinated better in a fashion, to make sure when a file is dealt with, it's dealt with with a group of people that you don't have to go from one area to the other to make sure that it's done faster. We will make sure, Mr. Speaker, that we address this backlog. It will take time, but we will. Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, after last April's tragic mass murder in Nova Scotia, families of the victims and most Canadians asked for a public inquiry. The public safety minister refused. Only after months of pleas and pressure did he begrudgingly agree. Now victims' families want all the reasons for that delay to be included in the inquiry's mandate. The inquiry has been announced, but it hasn't started yet. So will the minister honour their request, or will he just make them keep fighting and fighting for answers? Honourable Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and, and first of all, let me be very clear. In the, in the days and hours immediately following this terrible tragedy that took place in April, we immediately began the work of working with the Nova Scotia government to get the answers that families desperately need. And when families said they wanted a full national public inquiry, we listened, Mr. Speaker. And we've taken the steps necessary to put those resources in place and to, and to appoint those commissioners. I'm absolutely delighted with the appointment of Dr. Kim Stanton, who I, I understand will do an outstanding job in getting those answers for Canadians. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the terms of reference have now been articulated and it is up to the commissioners to determine the questions they'll ask. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. But it actually is half a year later and it will be a while before testimony is heard. The loved ones of victims, they aren't asking very much and they've been through losses and anguish that very few of us could ever imagine. They just want answers. They want to know why governments delayed, why they made them wait and why they they put them through even more months of pain and suffering. The government does have the power to set the mandate of the inquiry. They should honour this very simple request of the family. So will the minister ensure that the panel can independently determine the reasons why the Liberals initially refused to call a public inquiry? Yeah. Honourable Minister. Well, thank you again, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I understand the member's opposite interest in, in, in whatever political advantage he feels that that level of inquiry may, may take. But to be frank, our responsibility to the families of this terrible tragedy of this mass shooting is to get answers about that shooting and about that tragedy and to also make recommendations to, to the Canadian government and also the government of Nova Scotia, to the RCMP and every other impacted institution to make sure that we take the steps necessary to ensure 
ensure this tragedy never occurs again. Mr. Speaker, we have now impaneled a national inquiry, and we will get the answers that the family seeks. The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Mr. Speaker, whenever the issue of French in the public service is raised, the pandemic is blamed for it. Public servants need only meet virtually instead of in person for French to disappear, both from meetings and documents. Public servants are sounding the alarm because their workplace is deteriorating. Francophones are not second-class citizens, Mr. Speaker. What is the government going to do to ensure that francophones can work in French in the federal public service? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank my colleague for talking about the importance of French not only in the public service, but also here in Canada. We have the strength and pride of being a bilingual country where everybody has the right to, to um, grow in French or in English, as well as within the public service. Uh, as a Francophone and a Quebecer, it's my goal and determination every day to do so. The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the French language, the Liberals are getting a break, and at the same time, we're losing ground. French, or rather the pandemic, is should not be the excuse for not speaking French in the public service. Uh, the, speaking French in the public service is a fundamental right. It's not a favour being done to them. Does the government recognise that uh, it's not remote meetings making things more complicated for French. It's rather the presence of too many people who are classified as bilingual but who can't speak a word of French. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And this allows me to say a little bit more, and I thank my colleague. I want to stress the extent to which we are proud of the work we've done in recent years to strengthen the place of French across the country an official languages plan of $2.7 billion, the appointment of three bilingual judges as a Supreme Court. Uh, we will renew the Official Languages Act shortly. We will ensure that we create uh, a, a French university in Ontario. We are proud of it. We are going to do much more work to strengthen linguistic rights in Canada. For Pitt Meadows, Maple Ridge. Mr. Speaker, this government constantly tries to distract Canadians from their failures and scandals by saying they're focused on COVID and services for people. Not true in Pitt Meadows, Maple Ridge. Our Service Canada office has been closed for months. City Hall is open. Businesses and schools are open. The Service BC office is open safely, but Service Canada remains closed. Not everyone can access a website or stay on hold all day praying that someone picks it up. Would the minister responsible for ignoring the needs of my constituents <laughs> apologize and commit to reopening our office immediately? Yeah. Question. I disagree with his assertion. In fact, our government is committed to ensuring that Canadians have access to the benefits provided by Service Canada. We've already safely reopened more than 260 Service Canada centres, Mr. Speaker, right across the country. Uh, decisions about reopening are being guided by our world-class public health officials and with the priority that as many Canadians as possible will get the benefits that they deserve. We've also introduced new services to ensure that Canadians can continue to access benefits that they need, such as the e-service Canada portal, as well as opening over 4,000 community liaison officers. The Honourable Member for Beauce. Mr. Speaker, a senior is like a history book. They remember things. In July, the government gave seniors a one-time payment of $300 or $500 based on their eligibility. Many seniors are wondering whether supports are being created to help them get through this pandemic. The Liberals have recycled promises in their throne speech but they have failed to set out a clear plan on how they would keep those promises. Uh, as I said, seniors remember things, and they won't forget. What is the government going to do to help this segment of the population? And above all, when will it do so? The Honourable Minister. Thank, thank
Thank you very much for that question. Uh, while the government remains committed to implementing the policies that we've reaffirmed in the throne speech, as we've said, we are focused on managing the COVID-19 public health crisis. This year, we invested over twice as much on financial assistance for seniors as we committed to in our platform. We provided financial support to seniors 65 and above sooner and with greater support for the most vulnerable. Our support provided over $1,500 for couples receiving GIS. We will be there for our seniors and will continue to work hard to deliver for them. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Port Moody, Coquitlam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Seniors in my riding are trying to plan their budgets with the withdrawal rates of RRIFs in mind. Back in April, the government announced that it would reduce minimum withdrawals from RIFs for 2020 by 25%. Today, COVID-19 is still hurting investments, and many seniors are wondering how this will affect their RIF withdrawals in the future. Will the government be transparent with their seniors and let them know what their plan is for RIF withdrawals after 2020? Honourable Minister. Question and I want seniors to know that they're not alone. We responded quickly with direct financial tax free payments and supported over 2,000 local community projects helping seniors. We responded quickly to help preserve registered retirement income funds. We reduced the minimum withdrawals from RIFs by 25% for 2020. And as the market is volatile during this difficult time, we'll continue to look at ways that we can best serve our seniors. Honorable Member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. COVID-19 has impacted many Canadians with disabilities that have borne additional costs and challenges. Our government introduced and passed legislation to support Canadians with disabilities. Last week, we announced that the deadline to apply for the disability tax credit has been extended to December 31st so that more Canadians could apply. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please inform the House as to how many Canadians will benefit from this payment and on what date these payments will commence? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member from Cambridge for his important question. Since the beginning, we've taken a disability-inclusive approach to this pandemic, and I'm pleased to announce that starting this Friday, so three Whoa. days from now, 1.7 million Canadians will begin to receive the $600 one-time payment in recognition of the extraordinary expenses being faced by Canadians with disabilities. Mr. Speaker, I'll take this opportunity to thank our COVID-19 Disability Advisory Group, who, in the spirit of nothing without us, has provided this government with invaluable, invaluable advice. We thank you, and we will continue to support our citizens with disabilities moving forward. The Honourable Member for Sures, Moose Mountain. Mr. Speaker, carbon capture and storage technology has been extremely effective at reducing CO2 emissions from some of the largest em emitters worldwide, including power and upgraders. Countries like Norway, Germany and Denmark have all invested in this green emissions cutting technology. Canada is a world leader in CCS. With energy investment leaving Canada in droves, why is the minister allowing us to fall behind our international counterparts when it comes to CCS investment? Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for the question, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's an important question. CCS technology is uh, an important part of addressing greenhouse gas emissions, not simply from the oil and gas sector, but from many industrial sectors across this country. It is part of a broader suite of technology solutions, including hydrogen-related technologies, biofuels-related technologies that we are focused on as we work forward to ensure that we not only meet, but we exceed our 2030 targets to ensure that we actually drive forward with economic progress and jobs while we are protecting our planet. Honourable Member for Red Deer Mountain View. Mr. Speaker, the expansion of the Nova gas transmission line should be good news, but there's a caveat. Consultations with Indigenous groups ended February 19th. The government then had 90 days to reach a decision. That was extended by 150 days. The decision to approve the project was made less than 15 minutes before midnight on the deadline day, October 19th. The delay costs are astronomical. How can Canadians have any faith in the regulatory process when it seems to function in such an arbitrary way and solely at the political whim of the minister? The Honourable Minister. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And this government was proud to support the Nova Gas uh, uh, pipeline project. Um, uh, indeed, indeed, we think that it points towards the future, not only for Alberta, but for the country uh, in terms of natural gas, in terms of potential for hydrogen. But we needed to make sure that consultations were done properly. We have learned on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, our lessons from TMX. We need to make sure that consultations are done well in order to make sure that good projects go ahead in a good way, that good projects get done. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here in Canada, we produce the most sustainable and environmentally responsible natural gas in the world. Here, here. A company called West Coast Ola Funds wants to make value-add products right in Northern BC with our very own Northern BC natural gas. CEO Ken James is trying to create manufacturing jobs right here in Canada instead of another country. Will the government support the West Coast Oil Funds project that will benefit so many of our community's workers and their families, or just put up more roadblocks? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier in speaking about Nova Gas, we will continue to make sure that good projects get done in a good way. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, entertain, of course, any project and any proposal from any investor in the world, but we have learned certainly in, in uh, over the past number of years that we must make sure that we adhere to certain rules, regulations, and guidelines. We must make sure that we consult properly with First Nations, with Inuit, and with Métis, and we make sure that we take our environmental, our environmental responsibility seriously. When we do those things, good projects get done. We have proven that, Mr. Speaker. There are 5,600 people working on TMX as we speak. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Davenport. Mr. Speaker, as our federal government has made clear, there's no relationship more important than our relationship with Indigenous peoples. Since we were first elected, we have made enormous progress on advancing a renewed relationship, but we know there's much more to be done. It's also important to educate Canadians on the treaty rights of Indigenous peoples and the need to observe them as part of our laws. Can the Minister of Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada tell this House how the government will demonstrate the importance of this relationship to newcomers to Canada. Honourable Minister. Well, I want to thank my honourable colleague for the question and her excellent advocacy. From day one, reconciliation has been one of our government's key priorities. To build on these efforts, last week we reintroduced our legislation to amend the citizenship oath. The new oath fulfills Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action 94 and ensures that every new Canadian from day one will have a greater awareness and understanding of the importance of Aboriginal rights and treaties of First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples to everyone living in Canada. C8 is another step forward on our path to reconciliation. Honourable Member for Churchill, Kiwatnuk Askey. Mr. Speaker, Health Canada is telling us privatizing health care will help us deal with the pandemic. Wrong. It's about enriching their liberal friends. A former liberal politician advising the minister is selling tents. Let's send them to a First Nation that didn't ask for them. A former liberal MP wants to make ventilators. Let's go. We Charity, Jeff Bezos, Big Oil, make it rain. When Harper and Martin destroyed our public services, they were up front. This government cannot privatize quarantine health services. Why do they insist on padding the pockets of their rich friends? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, this over-the-top rhetoric is exactly what Canadians don't want in the middle of a pandemic. You know what they do want, Mr. Speaker? They want a government that's going to work together, parliamentarians that are going to work together to ensure that no matter where a Canadian lives, they have what they need to get through this pandemic. Mr. Speaker, we're proud of the efforts to ensure that Canadians have the devices they need, the quarantine facilities that they need, the supports they need in new, in, in, uh, new technology and devices. And Mr. Speaker, we're not going to stop. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Hey, Mr. Speaker, sorry about getting off mute there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the opportunity to put this very significant question forward. I appreciated the points made yesterday by the member from Wellington Halton Hills. We're looking at a humanitarian crisis in Nagorno-Karabakh. The Armenian population is being decimated. Ceasefires fall apart before they start. My question to the Honourable Minister is, does the Government of Canada think that it's a deficiency in our ability to deal in this crisis that we have no diplomatic presence in the region? We are doing what we can, and I applaud 
stopping military sales, but Turkey and Israel are sending arms to Azerbaijan. Surely we should be more active and on the ground with a, mil with a diplomatic presence. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are deeply concerned by the violence in the Nagorno-Karabakh region. We call for immediate cessation of hostilities, strict observance of the ceasefires, and the protection of citizens. We continue to support the important work of the OSCE Minsk Group aimed at encouraging a peaceful and negotiated resolution to this contract conflict. There is no military solution, and that's why we keep calling uh, for negotiations. I spoke directly with uh, Armenian President Pashinyan a number of days ago, as well as uh, with Turkish President Erdogan, uh, encouraging everyone in the region uh, to cease hostilities and return to dialogue. 